I'm going to start the recording and I uh, just want to say real quick, thank you to everybody for, for coming on again. Um, we appreciate each and every one of you guys. And so um, I don't take it lightly and uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to be doing this twice a month and um, getting good speakers like we have today. And, and so we're really happy to have all of you guys um, if you guys have questions after, um, after Allison presents, maybe, uh, raise your hand, you know, or, or just, uh, raise your hand on the, the zoom thing either way. Uh, that way we don't interrupt one another all the time and it's makes it, um, easier for us to chat. Um, and then I like to try to keep the, the questions you know, to three minutes or less or so, if you have questions so that um, we can get answers and we can get around to everybody. So everybody gets a chance to participate as well. It's, it's uh, um, important. So, you know, um, I'm very happy to have all of you guys. Last meeting, we had Gail Flans. We had some, uh, <laughs> we had some Zoom issues. Uh, I'm going to take the blame for it. I think it probably was me. Um, I must have hit a wrong button or something. And um, it made it difficult for people to get in. So I appreciate all of you guys for coming on today. And uh, maybe we'll get a, a comment or something put out that says we got that fixed. So anyway, um, but Gail did a good job. She was from Bethesda Hospital in Florida, and I do have the recording, um, and we send that out as well. So uh, today, uh, we're going to have Allison Phillips with Neuro Speech Therapy. Um, she's a speech language pathologist who has a background in providing cognitive communication and swallowing therapy to people who've had stroke. And uh, she's going to talk about how stroke can impact your speech, voice and language. Um, I think she's going to talk about healthy brain habits as well and uh, some stuff like that. Um, she's very aware because I kind of set a tone on how many minutes, but <laughs> we're going to give her uh, give her the mic and let her run. And uh, we got we're in great shape, Allison, as far as time goes. So. Um, take your time and let's uh, let's give give the best we can to to these folks. So thank you so much for coming on, Allison. And uh, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thanks, Keith. Well, I also want to say thank you for having me. I was able to participate in one of the support groups a few weeks ago, and I'm really grateful for that experience. Because first off, I could just feel the love and connection that everybody had for each other. Mm -hmm. And um, for me as a therapist, that's what all of my work is founded on, is that love and connection that I share with my patients. And so it was really cool to see that as a group. Um, and then the other thing that it showed me is maybe some areas where I could um, help with education. There were some questions that people had and some people had mentioned, well, my, my doctor never talked about this symptom with me or, you know, I'm having these cognitive problems, but I don't really know where to get the information or what to do. Um, and so that kind of helped me see where I could potentially be beneficial. Um, so I'm going to share my screen really quick. So like Keith said, you know, I'm going to be talking about the cognitive and communications that uh, communication changes that happen after a stroke. And the reason why I'm going over this information is to validate your experience. Um, and it may help you also understand, you know, folks in the support group, maybe you don't struggle with those symptoms, but they do. And so it will just help you kind of understand um, you know, another person struggles and learn something new. Um, and then the next thing I'm going to talk about is the value of speech therapy. Um, you may have received it, you know, right after your stroke. Um, and, you know, there's kind of a myth, well, I already had speech therapy. There's no way that I can get better, but we're going to talk about those myths together and, and how, you know, even years, 20 years after a stroke, there's still benefit of speech therapy. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And then I'm going to answer that question of what can I be doing to improve my cognition and communication? Um, Because you, this is really within your power, which is really cool because after a stroke, oftentimes folks feel really powerless and kind of on a, a boat on their own. And then the last thing that I want to talk about is the power of hope. I heard this theme a lot throughout the discussion that um, I participated, and I just want to validate that there is real research out there that supports the idea that people who experience a stroke and are hopeful, they have better outcomes than their peers who don't feel as hopeful. Um, So first, I would just like to introduce the ways that a stroke can impact a person when their cognition and communication changes. So first off, obvious is that communication piece and then your participation in, um, whoops, oh, okay. I had little uh, fancy things, but that's okay. Um, And then another thing that's impacted is your life participation. Right after your stroke, you probably noticed that things like taking a shower by yourself became difficult gardening or going to a book club, participating in church, all of those things became more challenging to participate in. And possibly you don't participate in those anymore because of the communication struggles that you have. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that a stroke can impact is your emotional state and well-being. And all of this is measured um, on what I would give and many speech therapists would is the aphasia impact questionnaire. So at the beginning of therapy, I would hand this to a patient just to measure, you know, their levels of communication difficulty, how much are they participating in their own life, and how are they doing emotionally. And oftentimes, you'll find out that they're struggling in all of these areas. Um, so I want to introduce you to a, um, a patient that I recently worked with. Um, we're going to call her Patsy, and here's a little picture of her, and I gave questionnaire to her. And just like I said, I found out that she was really struggling with communication, specifically word finding. So wanting to say the words um, that she had in her brain was really difficult. Um, She couldn't, uh, she wasn't going to church because she was afraid of her communication difficulties and being judged. Um, Physical difficulties and fatigue made it really hard for her to garden. And those physical components after the stroke um, made it difficult for her to shower on her own, which was really important to her. And last, it showed that she was feeling really isolated and depressed. And so I'm going to talk about, you know, after Patsy went through therapy, how things changed for her. Um, So first, I'm going to review, you know, the cognitive and communication changes that happen after a stroke. Um, and there's also swallowing difficulty that can happen, but that's not really what my presentation is about. And speech therapy can help you with this. Um, however, we're going to dive into more detail about those communication changes. So the first thing that can happen is what's called dysarthria. And the reason why I'm kind of going over these names and what happened is because when you know the name of your diagnosis and what's been difficult for you, it makes it easier for you to advocate for yourself. You know, in the grocery line, they may not understand you. And you could say, well, I have dysarthria. And this simply means that your speech is slurred. And that's because your articulators are weak. The next thing that can happen is a proxy of speech. And that's when in your brain, you know what you want to say, something like turkey. But then for some reason, the message gets jumbled up and it comes out as a non-word or a word that you didn't mean to say. Um, And, you know, feel free to kind of speak up while I'm talking about these and you can say, yeah, that happened to me right after my stroke or, you know, that still happens to me. Um, Another less known thing that can happen after you experience a stroke is actually stuttering. And what happens is your brain knows exactly how to say the word but then for some reason, the timing of when exactly to say those speech sounds is jumbled up. And then it comes out as repeated words or repeated um, beginning of words. 
One lesser known change is actually voice changes. So you may have noticed after your stroke that your voice sounded different or it was hoarse or quiet. Um, let me know if I'm going too fast too. And, and uh, Allison, let me just stop you for a second here because sure. don't, don't feel the pressure that we're trying to push you through this too fast. Okay? Yeah. This is really Yeah, I think good. I just naturally go fast. Yeah, <laughs> this is that. this is really good stuff. And you're hitting on the button of what a lot of us are going through. So uh, I just want to encourage you to take your time. Um, yeah, you know, I'll watch the clock. Uh, we're doing great. So sure, I, I want to make sure that we uh, get question and answer time. But this is very valid stuff. And this is uh, important. And I want you to take your time. Totally. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll go over one more as far as the communication. And the last thing that can happen after a stroke is what's called aphasia. And this is when you either have difficulty understanding what people are saying, or you have difficulty reading after a stroke. And that's that receptive aphasia. So language that we understand becomes jumbled, or you can have what's called expressive aphasia. And that's when you have difficulty saying the things that you want to say. Um, so kind of in summary, I so far talked about changes in speech, your voice, and also language or aphasia after a stroke. Um, I'm gonna pause here and just see, you know, a, sh a head shake or something, you know, did anybody experience these symptoms that I described or are still experiencing? Yes. Okay. Now, before I move on, and you know, I think it's really, it's great to see that this community have, has all experienced those exact things because you can talk about it and share, you know, hey, this really helped me. Um, and just knowing that another person has gone through the same thing is really empowering. Um, does anybody have any questions specifically about speech, um, aphasia, or voice changes um, after a stroke? Yeah, Monica? Yes, hi. Um, I understand, I have dysphagia, which you can probably hear in my voice. I had a cerebellar stroke about two and a half years ago. And uh, I just learned, I did some research, and that in China, uh, dysphagia is treated with acupuncture quite successfully. And, mm. uh, and that there is some work being done here uh, in something called um, neuropuncture, which is a... Uh, form of acupuncture and neuroscience combined. What do you know about this? I have an appointment. I, do you? Yes. Um, where are you located at? I'm in Florida. And okay. um, the acupuncture is at the uh, Moffitt Center, which is a national cancer center, referred me. He found me a person who lives about 20 minutes from me. And she's okay. very well credentialed. It's similar to him, actually. Well, I will say, I'll be completely honest, I don't know anything about that. And, mm -hmm. you know, my hope is, is that you at least, you know, it sounds like you're going to go to this person. I hope that it does benefit you. Um, I would say, you know, if it doesn't, you and I can talk about, you know, specific treatments that may help you or, you know, it may, when is the last time that you, uh, did you ever receive swallowing therapy from a speech therapist? Yes, I did swallowing therapy and also speech therapy for um, about almost two years. And, uh, and I got to a point where I was not noticing really change. And so I figured, so I still, thin liquids have to thicken uh, water. Mm. I long okay. to be able to chug a glass of water. You know? <laughs> sure. So you know what I would say to you is, there has been a change in speech therapy where 
you know, the last, it's kind of the old school method of thickening liquids, unfortunately. And new research is coming out that shows it's actually potentially more dangerous to drink thickened liquids than it is thin liquids um, because you're more likely to what's called silent aspirate, which means that the thickened liquid is going into your airway and then into your lungs and your body's not registering that it's going down the wrong pipe. Now, I wouldn't say that that is happening to you because you haven't gotten aspiration pneumonia within the last two years. You've been doing completely fine on the thickened liquids. However, if I were you um, and you have the means to do this, um, I would go see another speech therapist and maybe get another swallow x-ray. Um, go ahead. So how do I find an expert speech therapist? That is a great question. Um, so I think, you know, just looking locally, you can look at um, reviews of them. Um, and then, you know, you can speak with them before the assessment and say, you know, I want to speak with a speech therapist before we have the assessment. And I want to talk to her about, you know, is her method more in recent research or does she often thicken liquids? And I think that's kind of the tell all is, you know, some therapists, unfortunately, and same thing with all doctors, once they learn something, that's what they learn. So if they learn that thick and liquids were practiced 15 years ago, they kind of stick to that. Um, so I don't think that, you know, it would hurt for you to do a little digging on the internet and then just call ahead and say, you know, I'm, I'm really wanting up to date um, treatment for my swallowing because I want to be able to drink thin liquid safely. Um, so I would bet you have a 99% chance of being able to safely drink liquids because at least just from looking at you now, you look very healthy um, and you haven't gotten sick. And um, so I do think that there is hope for you uh, just for from me kind of informally um, talking with you. That's very good to hear. Thank you. Yes. Nobody likes thick and liquids. No. no way. Um, any other questions before I move on? I just wanted to make sure. Oh, uh, Michelle has a question, but I was going to just real quickly to for everyone. You know, I've known Michelle for, I don't know, on and off a um, couple of years, maybe. I don't I don't know, Michelle, but uh, I believe that I have seen huge progress uh, recent in in you. And uh, I just wanted to call that out. And I wanted to give you a chance to say something. So I was glad to see you raise your hand. My question is actually for Monica. Where mm -hmm. are you in Florida? I'm in the Orlando area. Okay. And I'm wondering, Keith, I'm wondering, maybe Gail Flans could help find someone for her. I'm trying oh, to see yeah. how close. Yeah, I don't Monica, know. I would also be happy to help do some looking for you. Um, is there a way I could get your email by chance? Sure, I can send okay. it to you. Well, through yeah. Keith. Uh, listen, yeah. listen, listen. Uh, I will take care of that. I will get okay. your emails to Allison. Let me make myself a note. Um, and Jim, uh, have a good one, buddy. I'm, uh, we'll see you next trip, but thank you for coming on. Um, emails to Allison from um, uh, Monica and um, and then Michelle uh, oh yeah I, I get her emails too so I'm gonna send those both to you Allison and then I also can hook up um, Gail Flans as well uh, with Monica okay. thank you yeah. Gail knows everybody. And she's, she's in Florida. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Good, so good two connections. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to go over the cognitive changes after a stroke. And these are less so talked about. Um, so you may learn some new things. The first thing and... Um, I think this 
impacts about like 60% of or more of people with um, who have experienced a stroke is uh, memory difficulty. You may, you know, a few months after your stroke, a few weeks after your stroke, really have kind of in and out memories of what that experience was like. And it can be scary um, because it's very scary to know what was happening to you and, and not or actually not knowing what was happening to you. Mm-hmm. And one kind of common theme is those short term, that short term memory and immediate memory you have a lot of difficulty with, but then those long term memories like from your childhood or maybe high school actually stay there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's kind of a common thing. The next thing that can change after a stroke is difficulty with attention. So you may notice after your stroke that you're easily distracted. If you're listening to somebody talk for a long time, you start to become fatigued um, and doing more than one thing at, a, at once um, can be challenging. You may have also noticed visual changes after your stroke. Um, you know, depth perception can change. You know, you may have like, I've had patients describe that it looks like there's lines going across their eyes or, you know, actual left and right cutoffs. And then the last kind of piece on how, um, you know, stroke can impact your cognitive skills is what's called executive function skills. And these are all of our higher level skills. So in summary, this is your ability to organize and plan things. Um, So maybe you were able to schedule um, family vacations prior to your stroke. And then after your stroke, it became really difficult to organize and plan everything that you usually would for that trip. Or, you know, even noticing your house, you may notice that it's a little bit more cluttered than it used to be. And then the last piece is mood changes. And I think this one is actually the least talked about. Um, What I say to my patients is after your stroke, you grieve your old self. You grieve who you were and you are going through that grieving process and you probably will be your whole life. And so I always encourage my patients to let themselves allow that space in their heart to grieve because you have changed. Um, And one of the coolest things that I ever heard a patient say is, you know, it was really empowering. She said, I am who I am now. And and this is me. And so she kind of, after that grieving came to a place of of self-accepting, which was really cool. So after, you know, those, those a year, a couple years after a stroke, you do experience mood changes because you're grieving. But on top of that, your brain is changing. So I've gone over this information and now the question is, well, who can help me? And I've got a good answer for that, speech therapy. (laughs) Um, So we can help you with all of these things. And there's been a really cool shift in treatment where there, um, especially with speech therapy, it used to be that we would take a big old standardized test, identify what communication and cognition difficulties you were having. And then we would treat those areas and do activities that were totally not related to the difficulties that you were having in real life. So unfortunately, people's experience with speech therapy was they didn't like it. And they weren't really sure what they were doing because, you know, playing a challenging game or, you know, doing a deduction puzzle has nothing to do with the difficulty of them forgetting where they put their keys every day. Um, So there's been this really cool framework that came out that's called life participation approach to aphasia. And aphasia is that difficulty with language that you can have after a stroke. And what this does is it helps identify a person's, you know, prior to your stroke, what were your social activities? What, what are your medical needs now? Um, what, what are your hobbies and are you able to do them? So then in speech therapy, we would identify what your goals are, you know, being able to do that hobby again. Specifically, Patsy example was she wanted to get back to gardening. And you're like, well, what does speech therapy have to do with gardening? Well, there's a lot of cognitive and communication activities in that that we worked on to allow her to be able to do that again 
Um, so then in therapy, what we would do is target what your goals are to get back to life. Um, and so here's this kind of example, you know, we could name this lady, um, I don't know, Pam, and her social outlet before her stroke was going to book club, but she's been avoiding it because reading has become difficult for her and also talking about what she read um, is challenging and she's not sure how the book club members will, um, you know, think of her, what they'll think of her after her stroke. So then in therapy, what she did with her speech therapist is she learned strategies that helped her re understand what she was reading and taking notes. Um, she practiced scripts for advocating for herself and uh, letting her book members know that she experienced a stroke and how that changed her speech. Um, and she also practiced what she was going to say about the book with her speech therapist. And then with that um, work, she was able to attend book club again confidently. Um, so here's Miss Patsy again. After I think it was uh, five months that we worked together, um, I gave this questionnaire again, and all areas showed significant improvement. She showed that she was confident in almost all areas of communication, except for um, when speaking with strangers. She was able to garden again, showering by herself was possible, and attending church. And her emotional state and well-being went from being isolated and depressed to being, um, what's the word? She was content and happy. Um, all through the work of her doing her home program that we talked about at home and also working with speech therapy. Um, so my point is there are real life changes that are possible. Um, and the next thing I'm gonna go over is kind of myths about stroke and co cognitive and communication changes and also speech therapy. Um, but before I move on, I just realized that I didn't um, stop to see um, raise your hand if you experience any cognitive changes after your speech, after your stroke. Yeah. And does anyone have specific questions about cognitive changes or difficulties after a stroke? Uh, you know, I, I want to, I'm sorry, Monica, give, give me one more second. <laughs> I get to, but I, I butt in all the time, don't I? I'm sorry. Um, so <clears throat> after my stroke, um, you know, I was a business owner and I was voted out of my business um, two years after, after two years because I couldn't I couldn't cognitively function. And not very many of you guys know my story, but, um, you know, that it was a brutal, brutal time. And uh, one thing I wanted to make sure of as you're talking about all these things and how important they all are, a we we need to we need to know that it's going to take some effort. Okay, it's going to take effort on our part to get through it and to get to the you know to to move forward. Okay, and I think that a lot of people in the beginning stages of stroke, they think, oh hell, this happened to me. It's going to be over in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't, and they start going through this depression time. And it's those folks that need to understand, and it's the caregiver that's with them as well, because the caregivers are going through the same stuff, right? They don't know about stroke. And so uh, I just had a conversation with, uh, you know, I do a lot of one on one stuff. And and man, people um, need to understand the importance of that, that you have to work on it and then um, track your level of work. You got to track from where you were and move forward because it's that tracking, it's that knowledge that I am making progress that's going to help you continue to make your progress, you know. So I hope that that helps a little bit and go ahead, Monica, go ahead. Uh, um, so uh, I'm a psychologist and psychoanalyst. Um, 
mostly retired, but occasionally I do sessions. And what I have noticed is that um, I'm very good at still attracting what's going on with someone, uh, but I used to be able to move from one level to another. Uh, from abstract theory to the interaction between us to the patient's past, etc. And now <laughs> I don't do that. And what happens is that I've learned that after a session, um, when I wake up in the morning, I'll be thinking about what happened. And at that point, I make the connections. So, um, so my first question is, what happens that that's the case that you discover uh, after the fact or when your mind is fresh or something like that, what's going on? And just practically, I should say, what I then do is um, I sometimes will offer patients a free session to uh, focus on what they, what I missed in their session, or I will just text them some information. But it's striking to me um, the difficulty uh, moving between levels of abstraction. So probably what you're having difficulty with is that kind of last piece that I talked about, that executive function piece, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. So, you know, being able to connect all those things together while you're in a session takes a lot of skill and a lot of thought process. And so maybe you notice that there are similar things in your life that you're having difficulty with. And so that could kind of help you piece together, well, am I having difficulty with executive function? Um, and at least the piece, you know, why, go ahead. That is true. But what puzzles me is why in the morning when I wake up, does it come very clear to me? Mm. Sure. Um, so from what I know, there is something about sleep that we comprehend what happened that day while we sleep. Or, you know, if you were studying that day and then you go to sleep um, and you study it over a course of time, you're more likely to remember what you're studying or, or what you experienced because of sleep. Uh, also, you know, I find with a lot of my patients that their brain works the best in the morning. It's the freshest. Would you say that's true? You? Yes, absolutely. So maybe one strategy, go ahead, Keith. Well, I, I don't want to cut you off, but Monica, I'm, you know, some of this stuff rings true uh, for me as well. And, and so I have my own thoughts and I want to just share those with people. I don't want to cut you off, Allison. Oh, um, well, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay, I'm, okay. I lose track so, easy too. So go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Monica, I think that, and this is true for me for sure, throughout the day, certain things happen. And if I don't um, uh, deal with something or I don't, you know, I'm not as sharp as I was in the morning, then I immediately, my after stroke, uh, I start going into an anger position. I don't get mad or, you know, pissed or but I get a little angry at myself and then I go down a rabbit hole and forget it. I cannot think straight and I cannot bring that back. And so one of the things I like to help people with and help myself with, frankly, is to try to relax because when you you're sharp in the morning like that, but you're, you're relaxed, you, you're just coming, you know, you know, getting on with the day. But then certain things happen throughout the day. And if you can try to relax and calm yourself again, a lot of times it helps with uh, your thoughts. And those, I just wanted to mention that. That's so true, Keith. You know, and you may find when you're in those moments that you feel a little nervous, anxious, 
flustered because you're like, oh, wow, I have to make all of these connections at once. And I used to be able to do that. Now it's harder for me. And so, you know, all of the first thing to shut off when we're anxious or um, nervous is those higher level executive function skills. Mm. Um, so you're, you're exactly right. I think, you know, maybe in some way you could use some strategies to help you relax, just like Keith said, um, which I know, you know, a lot about. Bev, Bev had um, a question. Go ahead. Um, I ended up losing years of my life in past memories and Slowly, after many, many years, my first stroke was 1999, so I'm a long-term survivor. Um, anyway, after many, many years, I got those memories back, but I was one that the short-term memory was fine. In fact, I completed my PhD after I got a stroke, and um, I had difficulty on the keyboard. I, I would cry because I couldn't remember how to spell the. <laughs> you know, and I was writing the psychosocial dynamics of personal religious experience of the Wesleyan. <laughs> Although, you know, I mean, I could say it. I knew what I was doing. I could type a lot of that, but the simple word like the put me into tears and I couldn't find even the right letter to start with. Thank God for spell check. And I did get my doctorate. So <laughs> it, was, it was pretty good. But it was crazy. I, I just couldn't believe that it was. And now, even now, um, I mix up letters. You know, I, I know how to spell the word, but I mix it up and I can't get it spelled right, even now. And this has been since 1999. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you practice, you continue to do, because I, I was a, a minister. And so I had to immediately get back up and preach and, you know, do whatever I could do. I arrived at Oxford, England in a wheelchair and two years later walked off the plane carrying my own luggage. So I never gave up, but it it is a struggle. It really is. You have to determine every day that this is my goal. This is what I'm going to do. This is going to happen. And even if you can't quite get it done, uh, you know that there's always the next day that you can make up for what you didn't do before. But I encourage everyone not to give up and, and to, to try your best no matter what, even if it isn't as good as it used to be, it still can be something that you're working toward to be more encouraged because it can happen that you have those memory losses, these other issues, the language problems, that kind of stuff, but it doesn't have to define you. Yeah, I love, I love that you said keep working at the specific thing that you want to get better at. And the other piece that I love you said is your reaction to having that difficulty is everything. And I've gone over, you know, with my patients before, we, we know that you're going to experience this difficulty we know that you're going to feel frustrated so let's plan on your reaction how are you going to cope with it because that's just as important as practicing that specific skill if not more important um, because we experience frustration not only in those specific ways um, on how a stroke impacts you but just in life in general um, any other thoughts before i jump back there's just a little bit left I'm gonna save. I'm gonna save a comment for the end here. Okay. So I kind of love that we talked about the fact that um, you have to keep working at the things, the specific things that you're having difficulty with, um, because oftentimes what I hear from my patients is my cognitive and communication skills are gonna stay the same. And even worse, I've heard patients that fear that their cognitive and communication skills are going to get worse over time. And unless there's some type of underlying issue like dementia, this is false. Your skills will often stay the same, 
or they'll get better, especially if, like you said, um, you keep working on that specific skill, they will get better. And what research has shown in terms of speech therapy is you could have had a stroke 20 years ago. And then, you know, let's say your speech has sounded the same, just a little bit slurred. And then you go back to speech therapy, you will still show growth. Um, and so that opportunity for growth will always be there. Um, another myth that I kind of already kiboshed is speech therapy is a place to work on worksheets and play games. And unfortunately, a lot of people have had that experience. And if you choose to go to speech therapy again and you see something like this, I encourage you to advocate for yourself and say, you know, I'm having real life problems with my memory. I'd like to work on that. And then the last myth that I'd like to go over is there's nothing I can do about my cognitive and communication skills. And I know this is a theme in this group is that, you know, you have the power. Um, and so what I'm gonna go over next are the ways that you have control over um, making your brain as healthy as it can be so that your memory communication um, skills are as good as they can be. And so let's say speech therapy is an option for you right now. You can still use what I'm about to go over and it's in your control. And I've seen patients make a huge difference in their life um, with following um, what I'm going to go over. So speech therapy is an option. What can I do now? Improve your brain health. And this is through what's called the six pillars of brain health. So the first piece, um, you can remember this with the phrase, be more. And so be more starts with a phrase of all the things that you should be doing, no matter stroke or not, no matter what your age, to have a healthy brain. So the first piece is being social. Um, your level of comfort with being social um, varies depending on who you are. So I've had patients that they're... Um, their social life included their spouse and then um, regularly speaking with their friends on their phone. Um, so, you know, it's important that in some capacity you are being social and after a stroke, life can become very isolating. And so it can be hard to get back out there and socialize. However, it's an important piece to keep your brain functioning at its very best. And I know research has shown that loneliness is um, more likely to cause death than chronic smoking. Um, the next one is engaging your brain. And so this is doing anything that makes your brain work. Essentially anything that isn't sitting back um, and watching TV. So this could include cooking, cleaning, um, gardening, it could also include, you know, more of those classic things that you think of, like brain games, um, playing Sudoku, um, anything that gets your brain working. Um, the next piece is managing stress and your mental health. Um, you know, folks more often than not take a, on a huge mental load after a stroke. Um, and oftentimes, while I'm seeing patients for speech therapy, I also recommend that they um, receive uh, assistance with their mental health because you know if if you're trying to work on you know cognitive skills but your mental health is not great it's going to be really hard to get better because like I said those cognitive skills shut down um, the instance that we start feeling anxiety and depression the next piece is ongoing exercise and so this means that you have to be regularly exercising exercising in order to get the most benefit. And research has shown that those who uh, engage in moderate exercise after a brain injury like a stroke have much better outcomes than those who don't exercise after a stroke. Um, the next piece is restorative sleep. And so this means, you know, are you feeling rested after you sleep? Yes, maybe you're sleeping eight hours, but do you feel truly rested? Or do you wake up and experience brain fog throughout the day? And if not, then you could work with your speech therapist on developing a plan for sleep hygiene. 
and also speaking with your doctor um, and just learning more about how to get restorative sleep. And I find this one is um, what my patients struggle with the most is um, disturbed sleep after a stroke, which is really unfortunately normal. And then that last piece is eating right. So make sure that you, your brain is getting the fuel that it needs to function at its very best. Um, so maybe you're looking at this and you're noticing a few that you are doing really well with, and then also a few that maybe you could do more of and take note of those things. And you can, after this um, group, can kind of think about, well, okay, I know that I'm having trouble with sleep. Where should I start or where can I go first? Mm -hmm. um, and an option would be speech therapy, research on your own. I know a lot of you find a lot of good information and also just simply starting with your doctor. Um, I've heard a lot of patients try some things on their own as far as like medications and whatnot um, without talking to their doctor. And, you know, I would always say just talk with your doctor first because they may not be as beneficial as you think. Um, and then before we move on, because the last piece is just the power of hope, any other thoughts or questions about the six pillars of brain health? Okay. So then the last piece that I wanted to go over was the power of hope. And the reason why I wanted to go over this, like I said, is because the last time that I participated in the group, you know, everyone was encouraging each other. You got to have hope. Keep that hope up. And I just want to validate that with there is real research out there that says those um, who have experienced a stroke who have hope have better outcomes than the folks that don't feel hopeful about their recovery. And so really, at the end of the day, what it boils down to is that hope. And I think it's really cool that, you know, sometimes that flame of hope can kind of burn low. But after these groups, um, I'm sure a lot of you that that flame starts to burn brighter again. Um, so it's really cool that you can achieve that through this group that you go to. Uh, so that's really all that I have as far as the presentation. Um, we definitely don't have to keep talking about what I presented on. Um, if there's any other, you know, emotional things that you're going through that you want to share. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm happy to answer questions. Are there any questions for Allison? John. Go ahead, John. I want to say this, Keith, first. You know, I've been doing this now with you pretty much for two years now. This is the most valuable one to me personally in two years. Seriously. Wow. Every, everything on these charts today resonated. Every bullet, everything and including, Keith, what you said a little early about what happened during, during the course of the day. Mm -hmm. Me too. This whole session was superlative. And thank you both for that. Thank you, John. That is. Yeah, so thank you, John. I mean, <laughs> seriously, but I, I really appreciate that. I, and I appreciate hearing from everybody about these things, because when we get speakers like Allison, which Allison reached out to me. Um, she heard about us and she wanted to come on and speak. And so she reached out to me and uh, we're so thankful that she did. And um, um, anyway, thank you for saying that because that that's mm -hmm. critically important for us to, to be aware of. Um, I had one thing I was just going to mention real quick, and then I'll, I'll kind of start wrapping up if, if you're okay with that, Allison, and please mm -hmm. hang with us. Uh, We'd love that if you would. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to one thing that Bev said. And she said that um, she was going along and then, and then she got her memories back. I found that very interesting to hear. And Bev, do you have anything that you can shortly tell us that that resonates with how that happened or why, or what are your thoughts on that? I think just the time that, um, you know, I, I had had the stroke and, you know, a lot of the memories were just pushed aside because I was trying to get up to speed to be still who I was. 
academically and, you know, uh, professionally. And so those memories in my past, like as a teenager and stuff, all went away. And I'm, don't mind my cat. <laughs> <laughs> she does that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now she's down. Uh, anyway, um, so it, it's, um, it, it was interesting because I'm, I'm trying to put together an autobiography of myself. And so I'm getting more and more of those memories back because I'm deliberately trying to recall that particular date and time and those kind of things. So I think being very deliberate about catching a memory that you mm. might have lost. Mm. Is yeah, deliberate and and acknowledging and you know being open to that's what's happening i think i think that's very cool a uh, couple of things that that allison talked about um that i'm going to be looking up and monica i think you mentioned neuropuncture i'm going to look into that for all of us um as well and um, um let's see i highlighted a few things uh the power of hope how critical is that and i wrote down how do how do you help somebody get that hope because as i talk to people who are stroke survivors and a lot of people i talk to are brand new and they are wondering that right or the spouse is wondering how do i help so and so uh get hope again instead of just sitting and watching tv because they don't you know, they don't know what to do. And I think that's a great subject. Um, I know that I've written about that stuff as well. Um, I'm going to dive deeper into that. I think that's a good one. And Allison, I appreciate you bringing that up. And uh, maybe we could even work together on some of that stuff. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I have a Brene Brown quote that I wanted to share with everyone. And I think it definitely kind of gets at that question of, well, how do you foster hope? How do you help somebody be hopeful? Uh -huh. And um, what it says is emotion, emotions play a supporting role, but hope is really a thought process made of what Saturn calls a trilogy of goals, pathways, and agency. In very simple terms, hope happens when. So what it's saying is, is hope is not an emotion, it's a thought process. Mm. And then what she goes into is we have, um, so hope is we have the ability to set realistic goals. So maybe that I want to be able to read one word at a time. Um, then what we do is we're able to figure out how to achieve those goals, including the ability to stay flexible and develop alternate routes. And as you know, Strokes are not a, a straight and narrow path. There's a twist and turn at every point, basically. And the last thing is that we believe in ourselves. Yeah. And so altogether, hope is a thought process that includes setting realistic goals, being able to change, and then also believing in yourself that you can change. Okay, so I love what you just said. And uh Babette, my wife has uh, has that book as well, and so I'm gonna go find that. Uh, um, something that you said though. Uh, dang, did I lose it, Monica? Wait. I have to go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Was it that. something that I just read? It 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 triggered something in me. Um, <laughs> You know, basically, we've got to believe in ourselves. And how do you get somebody to to start <laughs> believing in themselves? Like, you know, most of us in this room here have been through a lot of life, okay? We're not the younger group. Um, and a lot of really, you know, the younger generation of strokes in their 20s, let's say, they know they have a lot to do and they work at it and they get they get back in the game frankly, and that's, there's some truth in that. Some of us uh, have stroke later in life and we were on a trajectory and then all hell breaks loose and your whole game has to change. And it's depressing. Okay. I mean, you know, for me, it was that way. And for 90% of the people I talked to, 
And so how do you get someone who is in their 50s, 60s, 70s who had their their game plan was was there. They have a stroke and they cannot do what they could do. And that's when the depression really comes in. And so I'm dealing with a, a person like that right now. And I think that's a subject that we've got to uh, bring up and broach and talk about and get everybody's uh, feedback on because all of you people here, uh, I respect very highly. And um, I think you all have something to say about that. And I'm, I'm writing that down for another subject or a time for another, another time, excuse me. So um, sorry, I was rambling a little bit, Allison, but that, these are things that, that come up in these meetings. And I, I want to make sure that we are addressing these things. We're talking about this stuff. So anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to overtake that, Allison. Um, let me just wrap up then. Okay. Uh, you know, I appreciate everybody. Jim left, but Jim's stroke anniversary was today. Is anybody helped? Else have a stroke anniversary in in uh, July. Do they have their Michelle? When was yours? Um. Well, <laughs> I'm on stroke number eight, and I've had five in July. Wow! Yeah, it's not a great month. The only good thing is that my grandson was born this month. Thank goodness for him. But other than that, July is not a great month. Okay. Well, I am going to, I'm going to challenge you on one thing, Michelle. Okay. Your grandson okay. was born. Okay. But you are still here. You are still Thank with you. us. Yes. And, yeah. And you weren't taken. And so there's power in that. Please find that power and continue on. Um, you look great and, uh, you know, good on you. So. All right. My last strokes were, or my last stroke was in March, uh, as well as a broken leg. So in one week, I found out I had a broken leg, a stroke, and then a hole in my heart, a PFO, which I'm not sure if that has anything to do with the strokes. Probably. But, um, just over the last couple of weeks, that hope has come back. The, I've, I've, I've survived. You know what I mean? I've done that and I've rehabbed more than once and so feeling that um fire within again to go and participate in life is huge but the vacuum of depression like you said the the topic of depression and the vacuum of depression i can feel it pulling back on me i had a friend mm -hmm. visit last week and her we've been friends since childhood and just her um, she doesn't give me any excuses not that I need her to but her coming here and I don't drive anymore <clears throat> but her can-do attitude around here helped me find my own can-do attitude and before that I was never going to go back to work and now I'm considering going back to work and um it's really important who you surround yourself with. Oh, too. Oh, man. Michelle, that was right on the money. And uh, unfortunately, we're, we're getting out of time here. But yeah, please come to the next one. The next meeting is an open meeting. And we are going to call on people like yourself and hear some stories and have some input from others. Allison, you're always welcome. I'm telling you, uh, we have appreciated you so much um, for previous meetings and today especially um i really appreciate the fact that you uh were able willing to come on and and teach us it means the world i will get some emails out to you it may be tomorrow um and uh gosh i want to just thank everybody so much for for being on here and uh, i hope you all come next time as well it's uh when it, i don't even know the date, but it's the second and fourth Tuesdays uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific. Michelle, where are you? Where do you live? In Salem, Oregon. Okay, perfect. <laughs>
All right. All right. Well, thank you guys so much, everybody. Appreciate you guys so much. And we'll talk soon. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.